from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 374, recorded live Thursday, May 30th, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklin's.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft's Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Dr. Anthony Heilig about hard drive energy consumption. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And on the phone, I've got Dr. Anthony Heilig. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, so Anthony works for IBM Research and got his PhD in computer science from Churchill College at the University of Cambridge. So you spent some time overseas. Yeah, it, w- it was a wonderful time. I graduated my undergrad degree in computer engineering from Georgia Tech, and I was I was blessed and fortunate enough to be one of about 33 students selected as Gates Cambridge Scholar to pursue postgraduate work at the University of Cambridge. So that's kind of how I wound up at Cambridge and and in the computer science department. Had a wonderful experience, met a lot of great people, and I think more than anything, just got to see technology and education from a different cultural perspective, and and that was just invaluable. Well, I I was reading your your PhD thesis, and, uh, you know, computer engineering and computer science is a big, big space. I mean, that's probably why you went into it. You have a lot of choices about things that you want to get interested in. Right. That was actually fairly interesting because traditionally I would have looked in the engineering department for some of the things that I was interested in, but turns out that's that's more lumped into the computer science department. And, and luckily I found the digital technology group that really did a lot of the, the hardcore applying the computer science to actually building things and, and prototyping things. And that was that was what I enjoyed, just getting your hands dirty. It wasn't enough just to, to do some theory, write some equations, and, and write some program. But you, you want to see something tangible. You want to be able to touch what you can you can uh, create and then see how it works in real life. And, and your your PhD thesis is called An Analysis of Hard Drive Energy Consumption. And is, is this really um, hardware and electronics, or is this the bridge between software and hardware? No, it's it's definitely hard drive and the electronics. So there was a lot of reverse engineering, black box type testing and prototyping and experimenting going on. So uh, I, I've got so many stories and, and pictures of, of systems and disk drives that I've messed up because of how I instrumented them. But from the point of having to create a custom power measurement board, having all kind of wires coming out of a, a, a PC that I had laying on the floor and then writing the, the micro benchmarks and the micro kernels to actually test, to, to run the control tests that I needed to capture the measurements. And then from those measurements, you start to try to model how the, how the hard drive operates and then you can kind of cross-reference that model with actual um, running those tests on the actual disk drive. And the, the you, I can read it, but you can tell me the essence of what is the essence of your thesis? What do you what, what did you feel that you effectively proved with this this thesis? So among the major contributions is I wrote a disk drive simulator. So basically, given a, a block trace, the simulator lets you know how much energy that block trace is going to consume, and from that understanding of how disk drives consume energy or consume power, which which is um, energy. Uh, over time, you get to understand how you can change the operating system interaction with the disk drive for reduced power consumption, if that's what you're interested in. Turns out that that performance and power consumption walk hand in hand. So if you can improve the performance, the energy consumption is, is optimized as well. So for a for a desktop operating system, I mean, I'm sitting on a desktop computer right now, and I've got a desktop machine. It's probably using I don't know, maybe 150 watts or more. It's probably burning power left and right. I know it heats up the room. I probably don't care about that. I might care more on a laptop, but in what environment would I care so deeply about these tiny, tiny microwatts of power? So it turns out that you're right. For for the average home desktop user, you could care less about how much, or unless you're an extreme, um, um, somebody just trying to conserve. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could for the most part, care less about how much 
energy your 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 PC is is consuming. But in the desktop situation, where you've got a fixed amount of energy in your battery because you don't want to be plugged into the wall at all times, you you've got to be a bit smarter in terms of how you choose to use your the the, the energy. It's a more precious resource. So whether on a laptop the brightness of your display or you send your, your disk drive to sleep when you're not using it. If you're just reading the web page, you don't need your disk drive to be spinning at 7,200 RPMs or what, whatever uh, speed your disk drive is. So you can kind of spin it down and save significant amount of energy. Mm-hmm. So it's things like that. But but turns out the problem is more exaggerated in a data center. So if you're a Google, if you're an Amazon, if you're a Rackspace, if, if you're an Apple or, or if you're a Microsoft and you've got these these humongous data centers that that store data and they've got so many disk drives spinning for the most part disk drives mechanical disk drives are are the way you achieve the capacity that we need for data granted things are changing in terms of trends but disk drive energy consumption when you exaggerate it it can become an issue that that you can be concerned about Mm -hmm. so does that mean then if i could cut you know fractions of a percent off of my energy consumption, that that would literally add up into actual money that I could measure that would be significant enough to to tell a boss that we should change X, Y, Z, and we're going to save a couple hundred grand on this data center. Almost definitely. There, there's been so much research in, in, in power savings and energy savings when it comes to the data center. And you can look at processor, you can look at disk drives, you can look at network, uh, just in, in almost any field, whether it be the, the actual hardware or even now just um, middleware and, and software applications, you've got people that are looking at how do you make this more energy efficient. Mm-hmm. I would have thought as a layman that the, the energy expended by a mechanical hard drive was just the moving around of the mechanical parts, I mean literally the motors. But in your thesis, you, uh, you propose that the energy that the electronics on the drive consume are is just as important. Right. So they, they consume a, a more significant amount of the total energy than one would Im- initially think. However, it's still fairly small relative to how much the mechanical parts. So your the, the platter, spindle motor and the actuator arm, the electronics still consume much less than that. But at the same time, it's 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 more than you would think um, for an electronic component or an electronic part that doesn't have any moving parts, how much energy is consuming. And some of that may be proprietary to the disk drive manufacturer. Some of it may be due to inefficiency. Because a lot of things we find out is when when these particular parts or components were first manufactured and engineered, we assume that we had infinite amounts of power and energy. But, but that turns out not to be the case. So you can stumble upon parts that were unoptimized or ill-optimized for a situation where you have um, a, a scarce resource such as energy. Mm. So when you're, when you're expending energy in a hard drive, you're, you're doing the electronics work, and then you're, the electronics work turns into the physical movement of, of the actuator. And you know, work happens in that actual molecules start moving around. You're moving that arm to find the data that you requested. And the uh, where the data is on the disk actually affects the energy that is expended as well? Yes. So you can look at placement algorithms to help further reduce energy. That is correct. Is that, is that so important that you would want to build that into, like, the, the file system driver? Like, might you say that this file system is more energy efficient than that one? Well, that's actually what, what people do. So, yes, because energy and performance kind of walk lockstep, the areas on the outermost portions of the magnetic platter. So just take a step back. The the disk drive is made up of these platters that uh, for effectively, just think about three pancakes, and there's like a stick in the middle of the pancakes, and the pancakes just spin around. So on the outermost edges of the platter, that's where you can read and write data the fastest. And this is research that's been known for 20, 30 years now, and what happens in a lot of places is, is this technique called short stroking. So effectively, you, you limit yourself to maybe the outermost 25% of the disk drive because that's where you're getting the performance that you need for your particular workload. And you granted, you're killing and wasting so much of your capacity. You're wasting 75% of your capacity, but that's the only way you can get the performance that you need. And as a result, that's going to be 
the most energy uh, or, or that 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 particular configuration is going to consume the, the least amount of energy across any any storage um, array that you may have. So if I were an architect on a system that was going to be performing some some workload, some large amount of, of, of work or some continuous amount of work, at what level does the response, do, do I as the architect know that the responsibility lies? Is that something that my, my developers are going to know about and we're going to be able to co- coerce the data to live at a certain place? Or is that at the driver level or somewhere above that? Th- that's one of those arguments that that's going to go on for the foreseeable future as long as we, we still have the current programmer, designer, developer, um, division of labor. Uh, there are some people that like to worry about those things. There are other people that could care less about those things and want somebody else to handle that for me. Um, right now, the majority of the work that I've seen, it's been kind of the, the, the designer and the disk drive, the disk driver responsibility to manage the layout. Mm -hmm. However, if there is a developer that that knows what he's doing, that knows the ins and outs of his application better than a designer could, then obviously that developer is going to want more control over how data is laid out on disk, whether it's it's a database developer or something like that. You just don't know. But again, that, that goes back and forth depending on the particular use case. Yeah, that gets me wondering that like, does an Oracle or a SQL server know somewhere in the code or is it trying to optimize for uh, for the way the data is laid out uh, taking into consideration performance and then uh power consumed which might be conflicting um, priorities exactly it's one of those things where you you just don't know there may be some workloads that placement optimization is much easier and, and a more tractable tractable problem than others and you just have to optimize for the majority case. The amount of uh, of information that's being transferred as well will affect power. Right. So, looking at the the, the platters and and the way the, the the mechanics of the disk drive operate, understanding how much data you want to transfer is going to affect the operation. So this gets us into sequential operation versus random operation. Mm-hmm. Obviously, mechanical disk drives really, really stink it up when you talk about um, random I.O. operation versus sequential because once the head gets in place, the disks are spinning at 7,200 RPM, so you're pretty much getting everything for free. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you have to start moving that head around, that's when you start incurring those mechanical penalties and everything kind of just goes to pot. So, So this is where being able to run everything in memory, or, or this is where solid state drives really come into play and, and you really see the benefit and the value of their operation, of them being solid state memory devices. Mm-hmm. So when you were doing this testing, you had a board and you would, you would go and basically grab some drives from all different brands, all different sizes, and then you would use this custom board that you guys designed uh, to do the measurement setup. Does... Uh, did did you discover that the differences between drives were, were very different, or is it all basically the same? For the most part, it it was fairly similar. There seemed to be some differentiation when you look at prefetching and and how how the 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 on disk caches operate. And there there's also something that that's called zone bit recording. And and I won't get into all the details. I'll save that uh, for Wikipedia search. <laughs> um, but in, in zone bit recording, so uh, again, you think about the, the, the platters being some pancakes kind of stacked up with a, with a spindle going right down the middle. Mm-hmm. And there, there are, if you think about um, uh, a racetrack or, or, or a track and field track where you've got certain lanes. So on the platters, you've got essentially something very anal- analogous to lanes. And... Um, each of those lanes gets a certain number of bits that can be written in that lane. And obviously, the outer lanes are effectively longer than the inner lanes. So they're spinning faster then. Exactly. So you effectively say this, instead of doing different numbers of bits per lane on a per lane basis, you say, well, this group of five lanes gets the same number of bits. And so that's kind of zone bit recording. And so that number decreases as you move towards the center of those platters. And 
the way those zones are created and the way those zones are allocated a certain number of bits, that that, that type of proprietary nature is is what you see differentiation between the manufacturers and the vendors because that really goes into how they get the density that they can get, how they get the sequential bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. I see. Okay, so that's that's their differentiator. I mean, they we know that the disk spins, and we know that the disk has a general layout of sectors. And, exactly. But for and, the and most part, they decide how dense they want to pack the data, uh, what kind of right. errors they want to tolerate. Exactly. So you can imagine, though, those higher level decisions don't necessarily affect the overall energy consumption as much, which is why you see a fairly consistent model that we were able to create across manufacturers. Okay, so then calling back to the, uh, you called it short? Short stroking. Short stroking. Are you keeping on the outer tracks? Yes. The ones that spin faster? Yes. Ah, okay. So by using just the outer edge, you're getting you're getting that kind of free little burst of speed because that's the part that's spinning the fastest, and presumably you could pack the bits as tightly as that uh, hard drive's firmware would allow you to. Exactly. There you go. You got it. Ah, okay. I'll get my honorary PhD now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> there, it's it's crazy how you you think about what you know now, and then you look back to how much work and and how much blood, sweat, and tears went into actually doing all this research and really uncovering it all it's it's really amazing and fascinating but that's that's the beauty of research mm-hmm. and and again that's the beauty of of doing the work yourself and, and getting your hands dirty is you get to synthesize the knowledge in your own way and and that's why you you never can get tired of talking about technology well it must have been fascinating for you to to kind of you're, you're sitting on this and you're thinking about the decisions that were made in hard drive design you know 20 30 years before and even longer and thinking about, well, gosh, if they'd known this, what would they have done differently? Yeah, there, there you go. Um, one, one of the things I, I just can't stop thinking about is the, the three and a half inch disc form factor that, that you can buy, what, upwards of two terabyte drive in. That's what they used to sell 40 megabytes. And people were happy to have 40 megabytes. So, <laughs> Yeah, my first, my first hard drive was a 40 megabyte MFM hard drive. <laughs> and those hard drives would develop this strange kind of symbiotic relationship with their um, con- disk controller. The disk controller would, would have errors and cause errors such that the um, you couldn't separate the drive from the controller. Wow. Because the, the controller was separate, and it, it had a personality. It had errors that were inherent to it. And if you ever tried to, to switch controller with a um, hard drive, they, wouldn't, they would reject each other, like an organ rejecting, being wow. rejected out of a system. So you would wow. have to pull the, the, the controller card out and always keep it together, and people would label them to make sure that you never let these, this symbiotic pair you mm-hmm. know, be separated. <laughs> I guess it's kind of like a record player that only plays one record. Yeah, pretty much. That's a that's interesting. So, okay, so applying this information about power consumption and and the the relationship of a spindle on a disk or a platter and then kind of the macro view of that in a in a data center like a Google or an Azure or a um an Amazon uh could can they look at at their larger kind of cloud file system and make decisions that would affect the finances. They could see, cause, cause I assume that all cloud file systems run, uh, you know, some custom file system driver. Right. So depending on what type of service you're providing, you, you've got, you've got everybody doing, doing different things to optimize for the workloads that their, their customers run the majority of the time. Um, but, but yes. I'm sure that there's much work that's gone into really trying to optimize how these controllers manage these disk drives. Obviously, again, because performance is going to benefit from that, and you're you're pretty much going to get energy savings as a free lunch mm-hmm. along with that. Mm-hmm. But couldn't I take a list of hard drives like you've made or a testing um a testing style like this, and then when making my purchasing decisions, maybe as a cloud provider, I could say, oh, I'm going to buy the Hitachi or I'm going to buy the IBM because this this is the drive that is going to give us the best performance energy uh, mix in, in in this cloud workflow. Yeah, you you definitely could look at it and, and make a decision such as that. That's correct. The the one thing I'm sure you want to watch out for, is some of these vendors are, are kind of giving these drives their, a mind of their own, if you will. 
and you don't want a disc doing its own thing when it's supposed to be doing something else. So you've got to make sure that the disc allows you to, to take full control and, and possibly disable some, some of its autonomous functionality for the sake of the, the global good. What kind of things are you seeing discs built build in? I mean, back in the day, we had an 8-meg cache, and that was pretty much it. What, what, what do discs have now? You, you've got prefetching. You've got on-disc caches that, that have different replacement policies. You've got um, sleep timers where, where the disc decides to go to a certain lower power state when it hasn't been accessed in, in so long. Um, you've got some discs that allow for more expressive, and, and this is not necessarily the, the disc, but controllers or disk drivers that allow for more expressive control of the disc, uh, whether that, that's placement, whether that's prefetching, whether that's um, how much data to read in, in certain bursts, things like that. Um, so you've got a lot of different things that, that the manufacturers are trying to uh, bells and whistles, I guess, that the manufacturers are trying to to add on to to add increased differentiation because everybody's doing the same thing of trying to pack more density. That's something that everybody's trying to do, and and it's kind of like you're you're building. Everybody's building the fastest car, but how do I make the seats more comfortable? That that's kind of the, the the situation where we're in now. So for uh, for the average developer, though, I'm not going to think about this kind of stuff. I'll presume that my cloud provider is handling it for me. I, I think that it's safe to say that. I, I don't know. I, I haven't met many people that say they, they consciously think about how the disk drive is, is consuming energy. We are putting a lot of thought, though, uh, on you know, in small devices about how much energy uh, things uh, produce. And we've even had some discussions internally at Microsoft where someone would say, well, this feature uses this much power. So, you know, we're going to maybe consider doing that feature differently, especially when on, on, on small devices. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised there's not more discussion about that in, in the large scale. Like at, the, at, at either end of the of the spectrum, there should be discussion around energy. Uh, I agree 100. percent And it's it's not until you get into some of these mobile scenarios and these mobile contexts that you really start to to think about power and energy as the important resource that they are. Um, and I think from a developer's point of view, you think about an iPhone. Or, or excuse me, an iOS or, or an Android developer where power is in, in addition to memory are, are very, very precious resources. And these are things that you have to think about. So you're starting to think about these things on a much larger basis. Now, you participate on a number of, of committees and workshops and different, uh, different um, conferences. So there are people getting together like... It, you know, all the PhDs that are interested in this space and trying to solve these big problems. And then am, am I, as the developer, kind of many levels downstream, just going to reap the benefits as as what happens? As cloud providers do the right thing or as hardware providers make better hardware? Where do your works and your workshops uh, start affecting me? Well, I, I th and this is my personal view. Mm-hmm. I think the the best result is going to come once everybody can can start operating in concert. Because if as as the cloud provider, if you provide me APIs that number one I don't understand or number two don't have anything to do with my particular workload or my particular needs, then it's not, it's not quite clear to me how I best utilize what you're offering me. And as the developer, it's 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 developer's job to really understand what the APIs mean and, and, and kind of the extent of control that the APIs have over the hardware and understand how that affects other people. Because you've got to understand that the, these clouds are, are used by multiple individuals. So there, there's multi-tenancy here and, and everything has to effectively operate at a local level maxima but at the same time not causing anybody else else's uh requirements or, or or their um their their workload characteristics to be negatively affected by a particular local local maxima mm. what if i had um you know like you, you know we have things like smart where i can tell the reliability of a drive do we have the ability to query drives for energy usage and then make decisions in a in a in a dynamic sense as the drive is doing its work I haven't seen 
any smart characteristics that would allow that 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 such a a dynamic or, or feedback inter, um, interaction. However, disk drives are smart compliant, and, and you you can you can query the disk drive for certain parameters and understand how how it's functioning. However, I'm I'm not aware of any disk controllers or disk drivers that that do that and and in real time kind of respond to the disk drive's power characteristics for under a particular workload and make those optimizations and changes. I mean, is that, I mean, I know that's most of my questions are ignorant questions, but is that, is that the wrong way to think about it? Is this something that is a, a static thing where you build a profile for a drive ahead of time and then you say, all right, now I understand the profile of this drive, its personality, and then can simply feed that personality type into a device driver or an operating system and say, all right, well, this is a Samsung. It has personality type B, and this is a desk desk star. It has personality type A. Optimize appropriately. That's kind of what my dissertation work did. It allowed you to create that model, and you could hand off that model to a disk driver or somebody that wanted to know what was going on and say, here, this is the characteristics based upon the logical block address that you're accessing, and you could get an energy footprint. So that's the approach that I took, but I don't, I don't see anything stopping one from doing that in a more real time feedback manner. The only issue with that is obviously the getting the work done is probably priority number one and, and having that type of interruption, so to speak, is, is going to significantly affect your performance. However, if possibly performance isn't the number one priority and, and power or energy are, then maybe that is a, an approach that would be more amenable to someone else. Mm, okay. So maybe that's just something that isn't quite as dynamic as I would think it would be. Right. That, that, I think that would be more of a novelty than something somebody's trying to put into production because nobody's going to be able to tolerate those type of delays. So as, as spinning disks, or as we call them lovingly at work, spinning rust, uh, <laughs> starts moving towards solid state, does that, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of obsolete your your research? Were you doing work just as we were switching to SSDs, or does it still have a valid um, purpose? I think there's definitely still validity in the work that I've done because, again, it's it's really hard to match the capacities that we need with SSD. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, too, I don't think mechanical disk drives are going to completely fall off the face of the earth because they may simply replace tape mm. um, as more kind of deeper archive responsibilities. Um, so there, there still may be reason to, to be cognizant of, of the power and energy of mechanical discs, but it may be from a different perspective, I would, I would imagine. But definitely solid state disk drives, as soon as we can get the dollar per gigabyte at a place that that people are, are able to, to more easily consume because the IOPS per, per dollar um, are, are killing mechanical disk drives. So, so everybody wants SSDs in terms of the IOPS, and, and IOPS means IO operations per second. Mm -hmm. um, SSDs will definitely replace mechanical disk drives. And then you've got other things, the storage class memories and, and, and those, uh, those new up-and-coming research prototypes that, that probably will be on the market here in the next five to 10 years, I, I would imagine, in a, in, a, in a more consumer grade. So the idea that, that SSDs, you know, overall are going to take over everything, it's just not, it may be on the desktop or maybe in the laptop, but in the data center, you're just not going to get that price storage ratio that you're going to, it's not, not anytime soon at least. Well, I, I don't see it happening, but unless you can make the justification for paying the price for SSDs as the price exists now, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you'll see this this big overhaul of, of the data center because, again, there, there's a lot of capacity out there. And to match that capacity need with SSD is going to be tremendously expensive. However, there there are some shops that, that I, I have heard about that are biting the bullet and replacing as much as they can with SSD just for the sake of the performance benefit. And, and these SSDs, depending on what type of grade that you get, can get very expensive. Mm -hmm. but, but arguably, though, I mean, aren't you talking about going from numbers like 500 to 1,000 IOPS up into hundreds of thousands of IOPS just by, just, just by quote unquote, just by jumping from spinning rust over to an SSD? I mean, those numbers are, you know, orders of magnitude. 
Yeah. So, so at the top end of your SSD, yeah, you're definitely talking hundreds of thousands of, of IOPS. Um, and for the most part, I think some of the higher end disks are, are getting maybe creeping into the thousands of, of IOPS per second. But, but you're right. That, that is orders of magnitude and, and that's performance that you see. And that's not hidden performance. That's performance that you see. And, and as, as a customer, you would be very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. that performance. Yeah, I was at a, a conference in Europe and there was a, I forgot the gentleman's name, but he's in charge of cloud computing for, for Netflix. And he was talking about putting their, um, their system over onto SSDs and moving from spinning rust to SSDs. And they were doing it a little bit at a time just to test things out. And I think the numbers he were giving were, were fairly general, but he said something like, you know, I can spend a dollar here for a regular magnetic disk or $3 for SSD. And I think he, he uses Amazon. Uh, but I'm going to go from a thousand IOPS to, you know, 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000. And he said the numbers just simply are so compelling that he wants to move entirely over. It's going to make things more expensive, but the IOPS, he just could not um, express how much better that made their databases. And I thought one of the interesting things that was said by an audience member was he started kind of going off on all these details about SSDs and reliability and trim and all the things that he felt that the head of cloud computing at Netflix needed to worry about. And after kind of the audience member gave his big long diatribe on why this was a foolish way for the gentleman to think, the, the, the speaker from Netflix said, I don't care, I'm just renting them. And it yeah. just hit me like a ton of bricks. It was just like, yeah. it's just not his problem. Exactly. And, and that, that's the beauty of cloud, um, that as the lease, leaser of, of the cloud infrastructure, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about a lot of those things. As long as you can make sure you don't lose valuable data that you can't regain, then, then that, that's not your issue. Right. And, and I agree that that that's absolutely true. Right. He felt that the the, the power benefits, the uh, you know, the, the concern was about reliability. But his his answer to the reliability question was, if the cloud provider manages their reliability infrastructure appropriately, he said half the drives could fail, and that's yep. their problem and their right. issue, and they'll deal with it by p potentially changing pricing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. No, Scott, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Anthony Heilick from IBM Research, and uh, this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week.